Hello everyone and welcome back to episode 11 of the Where Am I podcast, the podcast where we explore the world virtually because we cannot do so physically. Now, uh, last week I forgot to actually mention at the beginning of the video that I'd sort of changed the format a little bit. Uh, I did sort of mention it in the comments at the end, um, but the um, podcast is now taking a little bit longer to produce because I'm trying to put a bit more uh, visual uh, aspects to the podcast uh, with slides. So please do let me know if this works better for you. And just as a reminder from, you know, how I used to do it, where, you know, I tried to do an episode a few times a week. Now there's only one episode a week. It'll be released either on a Monday or a Tuesday. And then there will be clues throughout the week um, about where I'll be in the next episode. This actually allows me to maybe convey a little bit more information about the site and it makes these uh, episodes a lot less stressful to produce and hopefully make uh, better videos quality over quantity. So that being said, let's move on to this week's episode. So last week we were at Grimes Graves and I did give a big clue this week that we are at a related site to Grimes Graves um, and it was actually even excavated by one of the same people excavated Grimes Graves. So let's move on and have a look at the clues I gave you. Which also brings us on nicely to our first slide. So here are the clues I gave you at the uh, end of the last video and the pictures that I posted over my blog throughout the week. So the clues were that the site I was at is the largest hill fort in Sussex, the second largest in England and one of the largest in Europe. Also the site of a uh, earlier Neolithic flint mine and it's been previously interpreted as a fort built by Julius Caesar or by believed to be built by one of the South Saxon kings. Those are two historical interpretations of the hill fort. So I'll just leave you, give you a few moments to look at those pictures and to uh, have a think about those clues. Alternatively, you could just pause the video. But like always, even if this is the first time you're seeing them, I'll just give you a few moments. And even a new photo or image. Okay, I think that's probably long enough. Did you manage to guess where I was? I was indeed at Sisbury or Sis ring. So Sisbury ring is a uh, important prehistoric site, well all sites are important as I always say, in um, Sussex in the South Downs near Worthing. It is a uh, scheduled monument and a site of special scientific interest as well. The main phases we're particularly interested though are its uh, sort of uh, Neolithic flint mine activity for Bronze Age Barrows and the Iron Age Hill Fort, although there is uh, a little bit of uh, later use on the site, including a uh, Romano-British settlement, a potential for a medieval coin mint. Um, it was part of a Tudor uh, early warning beacon network and during World War II, it was also the site of uh, an anti-tank ditch, anti-aircraft guns, and was used as uh, military exercises or used for military exercises in preparation for the invasion of Europe. And the site is owned and operated by the National Trust. I'll just throw that in there a little bit. Hashtag not sponsored. So before we go on to look at the sort of main activity, the Neolithic uh, mining, the Bronze Age Barrows and the Iron Age Hill Fort, just want to take a time to consider just uh, the evidence maybe for any prior Neolithic activity. Well, if I'm honest, there's not very much. Archaeologists do think that potentially uh, the area may have been used as a vantage point uh, by bands of hunter-gatherers to spot and track herds of animals. And uh, during the Mesolithic, maybe it was used as a place uh, for seasonal camps 
um, but there is just not a lot of evidence found yet uh, to support this. But uh, you do see um, similar activity on similar sites, so it is very much might be uh, that we just haven't found the evidence for it yet at Sisbury. So back in episode uh, 10 when you looked at Grimes Graves, I did provide a little bit more contextual information around the sort of origin of flint mining in uh, in the UK. I don't want, really want to repeat that here. Do go and look at that episode if you want to find out more about that. But Neolithic flint mines are sort of some of the earliest Neolithic sites we have. Uh, they appear sort of just before the emergence of sort of monumental structures such as causeways enclosures, uh, long barrows and passage tombs. Um, but the Neolithic, you know, was a time where settlements did uh, start to develop, woodland was cleared for farming and for, uh, for crop cultivation and for uh, animal domestication. Um, and Sisbury Ring and uh, only nine other sites in England became sites of uh, mining activity, and Sisbury Ring was a site of quite extensive mining uh, activity and quite an important mining complex, along with a lot of the other, or along with some of the other uh, flint mines in Sussex. It is uh, some of the earliest evidence we have for flint mining in uh, in the country. So like we mentioned with uh, Grimes Graves, flint could easily be collected from the surface around uh, the area at uh, Sisbury, although if this flint uh, was uh, weathered quite heavily, it be could become uh, brittle and uh, difficult to nap and work. Um, and we also looked at sort of other interpretations of why such big flint and extensive flint mining operations took place. These included that maybe the flint found deeper down in the subterranean seams uh, held important cultural and ritual significance to Neolithic uh, peoples, um, especially because, you know, the deeper, certainly at Grimes Graves, the deeper the flint, the much darker colour it had, and maybe that held some kind of cultural significance as well. Uh, but again, that is more uh, explored in, Grime, in the Grimes Graves episode, so do go and have a look at that episode as well to find out more about those sort of interpretations. And I'll put some information in the link, as always, in uh, the comments of this video, or in the description of this video. So how did these mines work at Sisbury? Well, the main, well, one of the main uh, interpretations being uh, put forward that an initial shaft uh, is dug to the level of the flint seams and then horizontal shafts and galleries were dug to extract the uh, the flints. Um, the shafts were then backfilled to avoid having to transport all this sort of uh, large quantities of waste material of chalk all the way up to the surface. Apart from the bits that were potentially used for construction or for uh, um, uh, sort of carving as chalk figures were quite uh, popular uh, during the Neolithic. Now, when we'll say, you know, what's interesting to consider is how you may have actually got to this point in the first place. You know, I think it's very likely that uh, these Neolithic flint miners started to exploit the surface level flint, uh, tried working some. Maybe it didn't work as well as they was expecting, or some worked and some didn't, so they started to slowly uh, dig below the surface to see if they could find more. They extracted more seams, and this eventually led to them digging, you know, these much larger shafts as they were following these flint seams, exhausting some and trying to find more. And then maybe when they found out that the deeper seams held better quality flint, they started to specifically look for this flint and extract this flint rather than bothering with the surface level flint, which was not as good in quality. But that is my interpretation of events. Um, there are other interpretations out there. So there are three main uh, types of mine shaft uh, at Sisbury, but it also maps quite well to Grimes Graves as well. For sort of small circular pits, these tended to be closer to the surface. 
and the sort of the beginnings of the mining operations, the large single shafts and the paired shafts, which were sort of linked by shared spoil heap. In fact, I do have an image uh, to help depict uh, those different types. So here we go. Here is sort of my artistic interpretation of those sort of different types of activity, although I don't really have the small circular pit uh, shown on this diagram. But here we have sort of three shafts, one which has been fully backfilled, and then um, sort of two or three shafts that have been worked, uh, one with a shared, or two which share a spoil heap. And, and I'm totally not just reusing this image from my last episode. I would not be so lazy to do that, of course. And here we also show sort of different activities that may have taken place in the mine shafts. We've got the extraction of the flint seams with um, antler picks, which is just, uh, shown by the person in the second from right shaft on the left. Uh, the removing of some of the spoil, as shown by the two other figures. We have the sort of the backfilling of the pits, and we also have fires being lit as some form of uh, potentially purification ritual, um, which we discussed in the previous episode. So I mentioned uh, that in that previous image, the use of... Uh, Deer antler, uh, which made uh, quite good picks, and at um, when um, Sisbury Ring was excavated, the flint mines were excavated. They also found quite a lot of ox scapula, the, the large um, shoulder bone, which um, was it have been interpreted maybe as a use of shovels uh, for scraping back the spoil, and maybe an initial uh, digging of the pits is well and sometimes these have been uh, arranged and they were found uh, arranged rather than abandoned on the floors of uh, pits uh, or shafts before they were backfilled and again the potential um, ritual significance behind that activity was discussed in the last episode but again these may be seen as purification rituals or as uh, rituals to try and um, uh, maybe appease some other higher deity to show to in the hope that the next uh, shafts they dig also have a good supply of flint um, obviously there's no direct evidence for any of these beliefs but these are interpretations that archaeologists have uh, put forward to why this rather strange activity may have taken place now, after the flint was removed from Sisbury, it was taken up to the surface uh, where they were sort of roughly worked to remove any um, sort of unwanted material from the outside of the flint before it was uh, then uh, transported elsewhere. And again, likely, like with Grimes Grave, was widely traded due to the fact that, you know, there weren't um, many flint mines in operation and that flint was uh, highly uh prized and was a useful tool and uh, when it was excavated they did find uh, evidence of this removal um, of the uh, sort of weight of the unwanted material from around the flint when the site was excavated so the mine shafts at um, Sisbury uh, a lot of the deep ones are roughly you know in the same size as the ones that were found at Grime Graves uh, but actually, you know, uh, Sisbury does appear to be a much larger mining com complex. There are around 270 known pits, ranging from around about uh, 3 to 36 metres in diameter, and again up to 12 metres deep. Um, and they believe this was dug maybe over a period of 900 years, sort of from the sort of early to mid-Neolithic through to the late Neolithic. So what do we know what was made from the flint that was extracted from Sisbury? Uh, again, like with Grimes Graves, a lot of the flint does appear to be made uh, be made into hand axes. A lot of hand, hand axes were indeed found during the excavations of 
Sisbury. And although some of these may have been good for uh, woodworking and for um, and, and for tree felling and all kinds of other things, it, most of them do not appear to have been used. They don't show any signs of wear. And again, this has uh, led archaeologists to suggest that maybe these were just not purely functional objects and that they may have had a ritualistic use. Um, and indeed, actually, from what has been discovered at other sites, uh, you know, most of the flint that is mined during the Neolithic, very little that we found actually has evidence for being used, and they do appear to be um, deposited uh, either in a ritualistic pattern or in hordes or found in association with burials and, and those kinds of activities. Now that doesn't mean that obviously no flint was used as tools that would be very nice. We do know that flint has been used. We have found axes and flint tools which have which show use of wear. And maybe we find these uh, objects in higher quantities um, because once a uh, flint object was was used, it was discarded or deposited somehow that we don't find in our archaeological record, or it was literally used to a point in which it would break. And again, although we still might find that, it depends where they were being used, where they were working, um, and we just might not find them in such large quantities. So what do we know about how the miners lived at uh, Sisby? To be honest, we don't have a lot of information, or they've not found a lot of information regarding uh, regarding this. Now, it's believed that they, that again, that um, the mine was separate from the agricultural land and that the miners potentially lived in uh, sort of temporary um, settlements or on temporary accommodation because they've not, found evidence for large-scale settlement at Sisbury. So it's likely that they may have lived in um, much more temporary structures, maybe small huts or even maybe uh, tent-like structures, but we just don't really know um, because it hasn't been found. But there's the old adage that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Just because we haven't found it yet doesn't mean it isn't there. These are all interpretations based on the evidence that is currently available. Now, quite interestingly, there have been actually uh, human remains found in the excavations at Sisbury. Um, uh, the e remains of a young woman... Um, were found and it appears to have been ki uh, killed maybe in a tunnel collapse um, around about 2000 BC. With her she was found with uh, remains of charcoal it may have been part of, formed part of her torch or, or lighting device and a miniature whale carved from chalk. Um, there is a uh, evidence of other individuals who were found during the excavations during the 1800s. Um, one of the man and of the woman, these were found in separate shafts, they were not buried together. And it suggests that maybe the exhausted mine shafts were also used as sites of burial. Again, very similar evidence was found at Grimes Graves, although at Grimes Graves it was suggested that maybe this practice took place maybe later in the Bronze Age where at Grimes Crater is definitely evidence there of a Neolithic settlement, which we don't have at Sisbury. So, you know, that may have been the case at Grimes Graves, but Sisbury, they may indeed be Neolithic, although they may also be Bronze Age, because we do know that people were living near the site, uh, at least cl reasonably close by during the uh, Bronze Age. Um... So, you know, the, the, the extraction of this flint, some of these passages that were excavated are very, very narrow. And archaeologists have suggested that maybe flint extraction may have been a rite of passage for the slightly built juvenile members of the Neolithic communities. And some have also suggested that maybe it was actually, in fact, women who may have been undertaking a lot of 
the extraction because it was easier to fit into the narrow spaces. Again, there's no sort of major uh, evidence uh, that we have to suggest this other than the um, obviously the burial which was found in the collapsed shaft but it is it is it is a uh, interpretation uh, given to maybe suggest um, how the flint was extracted based on the very cramped conditions that would have been experienced now it is believed that Neolithic flint mining continued in Sisbury to at Sisbury up until the end of the Neolithic, although like with other sites, it may have continued early into the uh, Bronze Age on a smaller scale, digging smaller pits, maybe closer to the surface. Um, there is definitely evidence at Sisbury of um, the sort of waste material, the waste flint uh, being um, taken away and used. Um, and there is this big debate among archaeologists about the role of flint during the Bronze Age and Iron Ages. How much was it used? Um, how significant was it? Um, but again, there's not a lot, there's not enough evidence really to say much one way or the other. So that really brings us to the end of the Neolithic period of uh, Sisbury and moving on into the Bronze Age. Now, again, as I said, maybe that the uh, mining activity ceased during the Bronze Age, or maybe it continued with maybe small scale activity, um, sort of shallower pits, um, and the reuse of previously discarded waste flint. But what we definitely know was happening during the Bronze Age were that at least there was a community living in the local area because of the um, identification of two Bronze Age barrows uh, on the site. Now it was not uncommon for sites to be uh, reused in such way. Again last week at Grimes Graves we explored how that area was quite extensively reused during um, the uh, Bronze Age period and we should sort of you know people always I think have this weird assumption that when one age finishes everything about that age finishes and people stop and they start anew and that just really isn't the case it's likely that Flint was still exploited over a period and people were still using the same landscapes um, maybe not in the direct exactly the direct area but people were still moving around and living in the same areas, um, maybe moving due to soil conditions, maybe moving to flooding, maybe moving to conflict, but still sort of largely living in the same areas. And obviously there is some evidence for this during the Bronze Age at Sisbury, but beyond that, we just don't have any further information really at the moment. Uh, which then sort of brings us to the Iron Age. So as I alluded to in my clues, the uh, Iron Age hill fort at Sisbury is quite extensive. It is the largest in Sussex, it's the second largest in England, and one of the largest in Europe. It was built around 400 BC and was in used to around 100 BC, maybe 50 BC, which was quite common for a lot of hill forts they do tend to fall out of use about this time wide speculation to where it might be and that's not the purpose of this video but uh, again i can put some information in the uh, description of the video for you to go and have a look at um after 100 bc the um site is still actually used but mainly a, a site of uh, agricultural uh, an agricultural centre with sort of rectangular fields marked out by earthwork and terraces. And again, that was continued to, to be used um, into the Romano British period, sort of to the late Romano British period. Now, a lot of people still argue about exactly what Iron Age hill forts were for. And again, I will provide some more information about that in the video, because again, this isn't the purpose of that video. Um, again, they were historically seen as military and defensive structures, um, but also when some of these sites have been excavated, it does 
There is some suggestion that each site was a little bit different and in the case of some sites being highly specialised. Uh, but the hill fort at Sisbury is what we call a, a univalat uh, hill fort, which means it is a hilltop enclosure with one single uh, rampart and ditch with a lower um, counterscarp bank. Um, and the hill fort enclosed an area of around about 26 uh, hectares and originally had two entrances, one at the eastern corner and one at the southern end as well. Uh, but again, I don't want to really get into too much detail about talking about the uh, Iron Age Hillfort. I'll have some more information for you in the link, uh, because then we could be sitting here for quite a long time talking about that. So we are going to move on to look at some of the later history at Sisbury. Pardon me. So, a very uh, quick um look at uh, the later history at Sisbury. As uh, mentioned previously, there was in fact uh, evidence of a Romano-British uh, uh, settlement, uh, probably during the later Romano-British period. This consisted of a group of 11 uh, buildings, two rectangular enclosures situated near the eastern entrance to the fort. And at the same time, the ramparts were heightened, possibly in the fear of sort of Danish attacks, uh, which were feared quite a lot towards the end of the mono British uh, rule in Britain and the sort of uh, gradual collapse of the Western Roman Empire. Moving on into medieval period, um, very little evidence during this period, but the discovery of two successive issues of coinage uh, struck between. Uh, 1009 AD and 1023 AD suggest that there may have been a coin mint in the area. Um, but again, not much else from the medieval period. In the Tudor period, uh, Sisbury Ring formed part of an early warning system that ran the length of the south coast. It was possible to uh, monitor from the top of Sisbury um, about 78 miles of coastline and the beacons consisted of barrels of pitch on top of tall oak posts. And then again not much going on at Sisbury until we reach uh, World War II where a anti-tank uh, ditch was dug around the uh, entire hill in 1940 and uh, anti-aircraft guns were positioned across the highest uh, parts of the ridge of the fort. Uh, the hill was also used for uh, training exercises in the preparation for the invasion of uh, Europe and observation posts were erected within the rampart to accommodate machine gun posts. Um, so that's really, that's really it for the uh, history of the uh, sort of use of the site, uh, we will now do a very brief history of the um, Victorian archaeological excavations at the site. So let's do this, a very quick look at the archaeological excavations, Victorian archaeological excavations, as quick as possible. The site was first excavated in 1857 by George Irvin. He investigated an isolated hollow on the southeast side of the hill fort and dug nine pits in the area of the flint mine. In one of these pits he found charcoal, oyster shells, animal bones and pottery. He also found some Roman and 16th century material and a William III penny. In the 1860s, Colonel Augusta Lane Fox, better known uh, by his later name, Pitt Rivers or General Pitt Rivers, and Canon William Greenwell, the same Greenwell who did the excavations at Grimes Graves, excavated 30 pits split over two periods of excavation, September 1867 and January 1868. All the pits were excavated to a depth of two metres until they found a solid layer of chalk that at the time was interpreted uh, that they had reached bedrock. They found a large number of flint axes and other flint tools, animal bones, teeth, charcoal, shells, uh, sherds of Neolith and sherds of Neolithic pottery. Uh, these discoveries led Fox to interpret the pits 
were the result of flint extraction. Fox uh, also then went on to investigate a series of pits outside ramparts on the southern side. Uh, he dug a 10 meter long trench uh, to investigate the hill fort ditch in which he found wort flints buried at its base and which led him to date the hill fort as contemporary with uh, the flint workings at the time. Fox also investigated some small enclosures away from the mines finding more uh, axe heads and Roman pottery. During the 1870s, work in Belgium and Grimes Graves led archaeologists to believe that the chalk layer discovered by Fox and Greenwell to be misinterpreted. Ernest Willett reopened one of the pits uh, dug by Fox and Greenwell in 1873 and removed the uh, densely packed chalk, which turned out to be backfill, to a depth of 4.2 metres. He discovered a shaft with a number of galleries radiating, radiating out from it, and he discovered uh, several ox scapula that he interpreted to be shovels. Plumpton Tyndall opened a further shaft a year later in 1874, and to, to a depth of 12 metres, he found worked flint and bones of cattle, boar, but died before he could make a proper record. He did convey his uh, the discoveries to Willett and Fox first. Fox returned to Sisbury in 1875 and 1876, admitting his earlier mistake and wanting to prove that the relative dates for the shaft and the pits. His first trench dug across uh, the ditch did not really prove anything. He selected a new area and dug a, another 12 metre long trench. In this trench, he realised that the outer ditch of the fort actually cut through the upper fill of two of the French shafts, a crucial discovery in showing that the mine was earlier than the fort, and he illustrated this with a section drawing which was a pioneering act for the time. He found galleries extending beneath the rampart, and he found a skeleton of a woman and some further mine workings. The last archaeological digs of the Victorian area were conducted uh, by J. Park Harrison between 1875 and 1887. Harrison excavated a further three shafts and galleries and discovered a crouched male skeleton during those excavations. And again, that brings us to the end of the Victorian archaeological excavations. And uh, this video is already far too long, so again, I'll put uh, the work which has happened since then, links to those down in the description of this video. So that brings us to the end of yet another episode of the Where Am I podcast. I hope you're all enjoying the new format. I hope the slides are helping as a visual aid. Uh, these videos are still a bit too long. I'm still trying to find a way to cut them down to more of a 20 minute mark. Any suggestions, please let me know. Please let me know if there's any uh, thing that I don't include in these videos that you'd like me to include about these sites. Again, anything I don't include, anything about the site at all, I don't, I think that is interesting, but I don't include. I do try and provide links for in the comments. Um, there's quite a lot of this week, if I'm honest, because there's quite a lot that could have been talked about, about um, Sisbury and uh, its sort of comparisons with Grime Graves. And because we were looking at such a large portion of history, from the early flint mining all the way through to its later history, we just couldn't, I just couldn't fit everything in in a reasonable time frame. But that's all, all that's left to do really now is to give you your clues for where I'll be in next week's episode. So here are your clues. I'll be at one of the best preserved ancient villages in southwest England, which was inhabited between 500 BC and 400 AD, and has a good example of a of a Fogo, Fugu, Fogu, maybe, I, I don't actually know how that's pronounced, and the underground, an underground stone walled passage, a type of monument only found in the far west of Cornwall. So those are your clues, they're a bit more tricky than the ones I uh, necessarily give, uh, but do keep an eye out for further clues on my Facebook page, Instagram and Twitter throughout the week. 
So I'd just like to thank you very much for tuning in for, for this episode. And until next time, take care.